good morning, Aldersgate family. Casey Freeland here, your communications director with some fun announcements. Right here behind me is a suitcase. We have five of our church members that are getting to take a trip to the Holy Land in June. And they are gonna be working with a school over there hosting a VBS and they need some supplies. Uh, only three things, they need generic Tylenol, they need Ziploc bags and they need peanut butter. So for the next couple Sundays, this suitcase is gonna be sitting out front. If you guys wanna help them out, um, that would be great. You can donate monetarily if you want to, or you can just bring those items in and throw them in the suitcase so they can take them with them on their trip to the Holy Land in June. A couple other things we have coming up. This week, this Thursday night, we are hosting a spiritual gifts seminar and we want you guys to get signed up for this. This is a really, really cool class. I took it last year to find out where my strengths are and where I could grow spiritually and get plugged in in the church. And we would love for you guys to do this too. This is something that Pastor Sarah tries to do once a year. So uh, sign up on your Connect card or sign up in the app and get to this class on Thursday night. It's so awesome. You learn things about yourself you never knew before. And it is now time to take those items out of your car and bring them into church. <laughs> uh, well, not church, out in the OMC. We are having our garage sale Saturday all day from 8 to 4 p.m. We want your stuff, but we want your stuff to be priced. If you can put a good, reasonable price on your items, bring them to church, drop them off, and uh, we'll get them all set up and set out for our garage sale that we're having on Saturday. If you guys wanna help out with that and work it with us, that would be awesome too. So just let us know on the Connect card if you guys wanna be here Saturday to help with the garage sale. And then a couple of things for our kids that are coming up this summer that I want you guys to be aware of because we need you to sign up. Uh, first thing is church camp. We've got a couple different options for the kids this year um, at Camp Galilee. The first week of June is an option, and these are for current fifth grade all the way through current 11th graders. If you guys have kids, you want them to go to a church camp experience, this is a great opportunity. First week of June, and then there's another one in July. So if you guys are interested in that, uh, check that out on the app. It gives you a whole lot more detail um, when the camps are, where it is, and how much it costs. If you can't afford or need assistance, please let us know. We want any kid that wants to go to camp to be able to go to camp. And then the last thing, VBS registration is open. We are super excited for this. This is for our pre-K through grade four. And uh, it's the last week of June from 6.30 to 8.30, starting on that Sunday night, um, June 25th. So we want you guys to join up for that. We're gonna need volunteers. We're gonna need supplies. We're gonna need the kids to come. So we want you guys to get registered and signed up for that. If you have any questions, you can always talk to uh, Shannon Dodson or Amber Hules over in the children's ministry area. But with all of that, it's a whole lot of stuff. And there's even more stuff coming up in the next couple of weeks that I'll talk about later. But we're just happy that you're here at church today. Welcome to Aldersgate. Welcome to worship. Good morning, friends. It is a wonderful, wonderful day, and you have chosen to be in the presence of the Lord. Isn't that awesome? He's with us always, but sometimes we need to choose. Hey, God, I'm with you today, right? So today, this is the day the Lord has made. We're going to rejoice and be glad in it. If you would stand, if you are able, we will have our candle lighting song, I Come With Joy. Far and near, find a 
Let's continue with our call to worship this morning. We rejoice on this Confirmation Sunday. We invite the Holy Spirit to touch every heart today. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing a couple of hymns that talk about our faith. I love to tell the story. And my faith looks up to thee. Familiar hymns that have really beautiful words that just remind us. Every time I see the word history, I think of his story. That's the history that matters, right? His story matters. Let's sing together. I invite you to join me now as we affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed this morning and remain standing if you're able, but please join me this morning. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, 
born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Would you please be seated? It truly is a great faith that we profess because our Lord is alive. He is our risen Lord and Savior, and he always will be. As Peggy and Colette and the choir lead us in this next song, I encourage you to take just a moment before you join in singing because this is a really dangerous song. We ask God to have his way with us. He's going to. And he will lead you in places you never imagined and set things for you to do that you never, ever would have dreamed. But he will equip you and sustain you every step of the way. So if you're ready to give God all of your heart, please join us in song this morning as we prepare to go before God in prayer. truly are an awesome God. For you sought us and you saved us by sacrificing your life on that cross while we were still your enemies. We had no knowledge of you. We didn't know how much we needed you and you opened the door to everything that we would need by opening the door to abundant life that starts right now and leads into eternal life. You call us, you equip us, you send us. And Lord God, remind us always that we know, we know, Lord God, what we were like before we met you. But you call us no longer sinners, you call us saints because you set us back in right relationship with you through the power of Christ, through faith. You call us your saints because you've broken the power of sin over us. And yes, there are things we still struggle with. There are sins that we are still going to commit, but the power of sin over us is broken as long as we lean into you and your power. For you have given us your Holy Spirit to dwell inside of us. And through that incredible gift, we have everything we need. So we simply come this morning as we've worshiped you in song, we worship you now in prayer. As we've affirmed our faith with the Apostles' Creed, we affirm it now in prayer. We love you, Lord. We are yours. We belong to you. And incredibly enough, you give yourself to us. Praise you, Lord Jesus, praise you. Thank you for all that you have done and thank you for what you're going to do in us and through us and with us. We pray this this morning in the power of your Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. 
in your name, Jesus, our risen Lord and Savior, that all glory would be God's, not ours, but yours, forever and ever. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Sarah. Thank you, Colette. Thank you, choir. And for you all, thank you for being here today on this special first Sunday in May as we get to celebrate the sacrament. And we also get to celebrate Confirmation Sunday. And the kiddos will be a part of it. I'm grateful as the banners are on the wall always to Carla, who manages to get these things done for us every, every year. We're so grateful for that. Um, and you'll get a chance to meet the kids at the end of the service today um, as they'll come in and introduce themselves to you. So today we begin a sermon series that Pastor Sarah and I will be doing from uh, now until like August. So, I mean, it's like Romans is where we're going to be absorbing ourselves, okay? So I'll, I'll read the scripture to you, but, uh, well, I tell you what, before I read and do this, the scripture reading, I would like to just give us some background. You know, the incredible part of this scripture is to understand that it was a letter written in, in the 50s, um, which is sounding strange, but it, it is probably one of the earliest dated writings that we have of the New Testament scripture. It is um, uh, dictated by Paul to a scribe known as Tertius, who refers to himself in the last chapter, and, and Paul is dictating it to him. It's an interesting time. It's, it's, it's a, a letter, as we hear it, we'll see that it was written talking about the Gentiles because that's who Paul is, but this is a church he's writing it to that he didn't start. It's not one of his on a missionary journey. There's some thought and speculation that there were people, pilgrims from Rome, that would have been there at Pentecost and, and maybe had experienced the, the, the Holy Spirit in that powerful way. Um, tradition says that, that Peter uh, started the church in Rome. That's, of course, why within the uh, Roman Catholic Church he is the first pope of the Church of Rome. But the interesting part as you examine and, and, and realize is this was made up of house churches, in a city of a million people, um, thereabouts, there were probably a hundred believers that were a part of that, um, and in house churches that this letter is being written to and be circulated to. It's also during the time of Nero that it would have been written, but it deals with historically, if you figure it out, uh, Claudius, the emperor, had um, around 41 A.D., I mean, and we know this historically, had, had restricted the worship of Jews, but it was more possibly around 49 uh, A.D. when he expelled the Jews. So this church that had existed there in the form that it was, the um, Jewish Christians were cast out, expelled, and were no longer there. So it left the pagan, um, uh, you know, uh, people that had been pagans before that were now new Gentile Christians, left them in charge of those home churches. And so there was this period of time where in, in 54 A.D., Claudius was uh, assassinated. Some speculate his fourth wife, who happened to be the mother of Nero, was the one who did him in. And, and so the edict ended, and so Jews could return. So that wasn't until 54. But when these Jews came back, Jewish Christians came back to mingle with the pagans, it kind of caused some conflict and issues, right? The Jews, of course, felt they were God's chosen people, and now we're Christians, and so we know things and how to practice it a little better. You know how some of the uh, maybe pharisaical Christians today even think they know how to do things better than, than certain other pagan Christians who aren't as spiritual as they are. But that was kind of what was going on in this church. And so they were having this rift. Nero took over in 54. Paul then writes this letter around 57 A.D. Around 61, it's believed he traveled to Rome and then in 65, it's believed that's when he died. I mean, give or take, that's the ballpark of when this all happened. We know that, that since then, in, th in the 300s, a basilica known as St. Paul's outside the walls was built in Rome. Debbie and I had the experience of getting to be there and seeing what is believed to be the chains there at this cathedral that was built over. It's a papal basilica, which gives it special status, but the, the, the burial place of... of um, 
uh, Paul. And then also it shows in a case the chains that they believe had bound him when he was in prison in Rome. So all of that's interesting background, but understand that, that Paul has not visited yet. He's longing to be with them. And so as we get this as the foundation of what we understand, understand that there were these two aspects of, of believers, and there's a message in Romans for both. Okay, so hear these words from Romans chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. Tell you what, since it is a communion Sunday, I'm going to invite you to stand and hear this reading of God's word. So I'll start it again. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ our Lord, through him we received grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to obedience that comes from faith for his namesake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve in my spirit in preaching the gospel of his son, is my witness. How constantly I remember you in my prayers and at all times. And I pray that now at last by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among the other Gentiles." I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Now, as we, as we think and look at the beginning of Romans and what this letter is introducing, and it's written to all, there's this challenge of understanding that Something is, is just going to be underlying. It's interesting. I haven't read the book yet, but Sarah turned me on to a book by oh, hold it, Scott, um, you know, McKnight, Scott McKnight, who wrote a book called Reading Romans Backwards. And, and it's like, what? Well, he thinks that people get bogged down. And here we're talking about several weeks of a message. We don't want you to get bogged down. But if you read like one through, through eight, it kind of gets you there, and then you just kind of get bogged down. And, and so he says you should read 12 through 16 first, and then 9 through 11, and then start with 1 through 4, and then do 5 through 8. Now, I haven't explored all of that. I've listened to a little lecture on it. But I understand that, that this is kind of one of the most important letters that was ever written. Because it is designed and meant to, to impart and understand this church of that time, but it speaks volumes to the church of our time. And so when we think about it being written in 57 AD, it, it, is, it is dictated. I said written by Paul. It, it, so who was Paul? Paul was a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, 
and set apart for the gospel of God. Now, leaving those up there, we see his life and we understand, right? Saul was his name first, right? He came to persecute and destroy the Christian church, to kill Christians. He had papers. He was on his way to Damascus. In Acts chapter 9, you know he held the cloaks when Stephen was stoned to death. In the book of Acts, it tells us, we know this guy was seeking nothing but bad. And, And so, Paul, interestingly enough, with his background as, a, as, as, as from Tarsus, you know, um, um, and, and the background in the Greek and knowing how to speak it and how to communicate, made him an ideal person for Jesus to meet on that Damascus road, to blind him, right, and ask, why, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And in that instance, in that moment, there's a a, a, a movement to Damascus, and then, of course, we know the story of Ananias and him being told to touch this enemy and, and, and all the challenge of that faith decision by him to even follow through with that. And, and in that moment, it says that the scales fell from, from Saul, Paul's eyes, and, and he could see. But something even more important happened. The Holy Spirit came upon him. And the Holy Spirit came upon this person that now knew that he was going to be this messenger, right? As a servant, he was willing to just do whatever his master called him to do. And as an apostle, he was a messenger. He knew what he had to share and he knew what he was going to be a part of, but because he was set apart for the gospel of God. Now, Thinking about those, those things, being a servant and apostle, we talk about that. Today, the kids will be confirmed as disciples of Jesus Christ in Christ's holy church. Six of them will make a decision to become a part of and full members of Aldersgate Church. And, and that decision hasn't been made lightly, and, and, and they will do that. But understanding that we know that as a disciple, we're supposed to serve. We know as a disciple, we should be messengers of the Gospels, ministers of what it says and shares But do we remember that we too have been set apart for the gospel of God? Paul, as the missionary, saw himself completely set apart for this gospel. But do we see ourselves understanding that once we understand this message that we've received, then we are set apart from what the world has to offer? And today, that's the challenge. The challenge for anybody set apart, for anybody that wants to be a a messenger and speak to it and to be the servant of Christ, you've got to understand there is is an untruth that's spreading throughout the land, that we're battling against a false gospel. We're battling against people that claim to know and and claim to, to speak about it. Now, see, the difference between the Jews and the non-Jews in this situation, they all believed in Jesus, and Jesus and his teachings, how to practice it, had gotten a little convoluted, too. But they were called to be united, and, and Paul will keep working towards that. But do we know how set apart we are? The message of the gospel is the calling for action of obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. That is what the gospel is defined as. It's an action. It's calling for an action of obedience that come from faith for his name's sake. In other words, this saving grace of the gospel and the message of it calls us to obedience. And we don't understand what obedience is when we take action that is outside of God's will. There's nothing obedient about it. When we then try to let the gospel or the scriptures unfold in a way that allows us to consider a path and a direction and doing something that is not from our namesake and not what Jesus taught and not what Jesus was advocating, then we start stepping into a realm that could be considered that we might be false in the gospel we're trying to share and spread. The question, and for us and what's going on, what is your calling, your vocation, your job, your work, your ministry? It's interesting, and it happens a lot, as we think about the the time when Christ came into our heart. I loved being a youth minister, but I also, we'd always go on these mission trip experiences, and kids would come back wanting to be missionaries, and parents hated it. No, what are you talking about? That you want to go and serve in, in, in blah, 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 wherever. It was like something they didn't understand. For us, ministry doesn't mean that we work financially as a staff person at a church. 
happens a lot where people try to drive vocations and do other stuff in the, in the world, and they say, well, I really feel called to ministry. Now, are they called to ministry or are they uncalled from the world and the work that they don't like? I don't know. God knows what's calling somebody to something, but for every one of us, we have a job. We have a work. We have a ministry because that's our life. You are called, though, from this real calling. It's not to find a ministry. It's not to find a work. It's not to find some job to do. It is to know you belong to Jesus Christ. It's what Paul states very clearly. You belong to Jesus Christ. That is your calling. That's all of our callings. We belong to Christ. And the interesting part of that, when we really believe that, and when we do that, then as people that belong to Christ, the love that flows from that for one another as a church begins to be powerful and real because people will be there in every instance to love one another. And then because we belong to Jesus Christ, we understand that when we leave these walls and go beyond these walls, we begin to understand that we belong to Jesus Christ there too. See, for the confirmands and what happens, the history of confirmation is we have a large gathering of kids. This year it's a little smaller than, than, than previous years, but the class size was just smaller. And, and, and yet, of all those that are confirmed, by the time they reach the ninth grade, a smaller percentage of them is still around, even though they promised. They promised they'd be faithful and loyal to the church of Christ. Families bring and participate and make sure their kids are there, but then they feel like they fulfilled their obligation, right? We've, we've, we've finished confirmation, and now it, we can just kind of ease up a little bit. And then by the time these kids that have been confirmed in Christ, that, that have made that decision, by the time they reach college age, doesn't mean they're in college, they begin to start questioning what they professed as faith before. Because they have not continued to nurture it and see it grow, they've stopped belonging to Christ. But adults make the same decisions. Adults make a decision to um, uphold a local church and in our church by their prayers, their presence, their gifts, their service, and their faithful witness. What does that mean? It means whatever they live out for it to mean. But it means something as a disciple that you live your life in accordance with what you promised. But if we think about it individually, and myself included, how do I live out that by belonging to Jesus every day? See, there was a harvest among this church. There's a harvest among our church for sure. People are seeking the truth and wanting revival and crying out for something that looks real and not something that's fake. And, and there's a harvest that's among us too. The harvest among you that he sees and Paul is reaching out is, I see everybody as Greeks and non-Greeks. I'm, I'm there for them. And I'm there for the wise, and I'm there for the foolish. And you all of a sudden think about that statement that he makes. He's glumping them all together. Amongst the Greeks and non-Greeks, some are wise <laughs> and some are foolish. And I'm speaking to all of them. As we delve into, we'll talk about big sin and little sins and, and have a discussion throughout what Paul is journeying through on this. But in this beginning part, the key to all of it, of what he's bringing is, and, and it says this in the NLT a little differently, because our message today about an unashamed gospel that we'll be carrying for these weeks ahead is that, for I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. This good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. Now let's, oh, did I have that, David, in there? The NLT version of it? Oh, there we go. Thank you, thank you, thank you. What I want you to do, for I am not ashamed. What does it mean not to be ashamed? What I love when you look at the Greek and you examine it, it's, it's a negative um, uh, and, and, and it's strong negative, right? I am not, and what's ashamed? Well, that's something that you, you know, don't feel like there's a shame towards doing that very thing. I'm not ashamed of what I'm getting ready to proclaim and declare. 
I can never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ that calls all people to repentance. In order to find salvation, they can only do it through surrendering their heart to a holy God by receiving the Son who died for them. That's salvation. I'm not ashamed of that. I'll declare it forever. Have you seen the church continually back down and say there's more than one way to get to heaven? Have you seen people preach that and share that like that's what God intended with his son, Jesus Christ? I'm going to send Jesus and tell his disciples to go to the very ends of the earth, but don't try to change other people's viewpoint about religion. Is there anything indicated in the gospel of Jesus Christ that would say, I should not promote Jesus Christ as the way, the truth, and the life? Anything short of that? I believe means you're ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because you don't think it really saves. You think something else can save somebody. That's what's happening in the world and the church today. We have a gospel that we say, well, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, but my gospel is so wonderful and great that I just have to love all people. And that's what I'll do is love all people. I don't have a problem with you loving all people. But if you will love them and not tell them about Jesus Christ, then you don't love them. If you declare you love somebody and you're going to show love to them, but you won't speak the gospel in love to them, then you're ashamed of it. That seems to be something that makes Christians uncomfortable and worried because that's not the way the world sees it today. I wonder why. I love and I, I listen to it. Go back and listen to the Paul Harvey radio message from 1965. I think it was 1965 where he explains how the prince of darkness will take over and defeat the world. Dave, go ahead and keep that up there, please. Um, It is the power of God doing what? At work. The gospel is the power of God at work. I mean, do we feel that power? We keep talking about it and thinking about it, but do you feel the power of God inside of you that says, there is nothing in this world that can come against me that that can defeat me. There is nothing in this power of God that is at work saving everyone who believes. But how do they believe? Because the witnesses that demonstrate it, the witnesses that are able to present it in, in, in realness, authenticity, and genuineness, What I love, this confirmation class had lots of challenging personalities in it, even for a small group. But it also includes, you know, out of the 11 kids, two of them have lost their parents in in the last two years. And it's like, a parent, I should say. One One a mom and one a dad. And I thought, how unique that these kids are coming together in, in, and, and are in this time of working through life together. And we get a chance to tell them about what brings power to them when they feel at times probably at a loss. This is true because it's good news. And it's good that the NLT, it's, called, it's, it's the gospel there in, in ways, but it's called the good news, tells us how God makes us right in his sight. See, there's so many people that think I can be made right, I can be made right. I can be made right if I just do good things, if I work hard enough at it, then I'll be right with God. And yet, it's only this, the gospel, that can make you right in God's sight. And then it's accomplished from start to finish by what? Faith. And that's all there is to it. It's faith. But somehow it's been convoluted in a way that that makes you perform and think you have to perform a certain way. And and yet that's not it. From start to finish, it is through faith that a righteous person has what? Life. I love this poem that J.D. Walt has written talking about a friend he had bumped into who had, had, had just been dealing with life and what she said and told him made it realize that this is what some people think is the gospel and some people think is Jesus. And so he wrote this poem called The Hard and Beautiful Truth. And the poem reads this way. I don't want you to think I'm not a good person. I don't want you to think I'm not a good person. That's what an old friend said to me. Upon meeting again after decades apart and the long confession of her broken story. I assured her with the hard and beautiful truth, you are not a good person. (laughs) 
You are not a good person. I'm not either. We are, we are broken sinners. Something deep in me, and maybe you too, wants to believe we are good. Or worse, that we are bad. That we just need to lose 20 pounds. Drop a few bad habits and try harder to be better. Then I assure myself with the hard and beautiful truth. Good people and bad people is a lie from the pit of hell. And the way from good to great or bad to worse paves the way there. Jesus only goes from death to life, lost to found, slave to free, broken to beautiful. Then she asked me, if you are not good, what are you? Loved, I said. I am loved, and you are too. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because it truly is the righteous that will live that life. And the righteous will live by faith. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we stop and and think for a moment about what the gospel is of Jesus Christ. The good news. The good news that says that none of us are good enough. And can only be made righteous through faith in Christ. But do we experience that power of God? Do we experience what truly is that understanding of faith? Today, God, as we journey into Romans, may we see it from a perspective of who we are. And that as someone that wants to follow Christ, to be a servant, to be a messenger, to be set apart, may we continue to let you set us apart and help us to stand firm in who you created us to be. Today, God, there's confirmands that need to know their identity, their identity in Jesus Christ. May we be a church that surrounds them today with love, but in all the days beyond, that so when they reach that senior year of high school, They have grown more as a disciple and are still a part of the fellowship of believers with the commitment that they make today. May we stay committed throughout this journey by faithfully following ourselves, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God, as we are here today, we bow before you knowing that the sacrament we're getting ready to share, that in this sacrament we have an opportunity to remember to experience the forgiveness, to experience the power that is in that. His death, his, his, his life is death, his resurrection. Fully alive, we are Easter people prepared for this journey to share the good news and to live it. So as we come to this table, God, we confess that we have fallen short, that we have not always obeyed you and shown that obedience that we're called to, that we sometime have failed to act, and that was an act of disobedience, to love the poor and the needy, to provide and to see them and to not see them as, or to make them invisible and to ignore them. God, may we truly confess those moments when we have fallen short of your mark and what you have called your people to be, to live, to do. So hear us as we silently pray those confessions to you now, God. Oh God, how you know our hearts, how you hear our confessions, and how you forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And it is in that cleansing that we have life and have it to the full. Today, God, we ask that you would pour out your spirit on all that have gathered, that we would unite together our voices and pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples as we come to share in this sacrament. Hear our voices as we pray together that prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed it be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would you pray with me again? Lord God, truly pour out your Holy Spirit, not only on us gathered, but upon this bread and upon this juice that it would become for us the body and the blood of Christ. That we as children of God would receive it with hearts that have been cleansed by your Holy Spirit and the grace that is so real and powerful today. Open up our hearts, God, so the Holy Spirit is at work through this sacrament in each of our lives so we know our servanthood, the messenger that we are, and how we're set apart from this world. We ask this humbly, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Christ, when he gathered with his disciples, had given thanks to his Father, too, and he broke the bread and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Take, eat, and do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, he lifted the cup gave thanks to his father and said, take, drink. This is my blood shed for you, my blood of the new covenant. Powerful and there for the remission of all sin. Take and receive and do this in remembrance of me. I invite those that will be helping us to serve to come forward. If you need to be served at your chair, please let the usher know. If you've received it already through the wafer and the juice, we pray the blessing upon those two for the sacrament that you receive. And the ushers will direct you. We'll have gluten-free at this station, and you'll receive it, the bread first and then dip it into the cup by the method of intinction.
That's right. We'll do. We'll, we'll share the closing hymn, right? Amen. Okay, I'm going to invite you all to stand, <laughs> and we'll share in the closing hymn, and then you'll get seated again once the confirmands are ready to come in. But we'll see a confirmation video as they come in. As you make a decision today, there is time for that. There's time for you to come forward and kneel at the altar and and truly know that you're a messenger and you're a servant and you want the salvation that has truly been meant for you, the power of God that's meant for you too. It's available to all. Let's join our voices in song as we share this message today. first first one more time cuz it's talking about not being ashamed i love that here we go i'm not ashamed to own my Please be seated, and I believe we have a video we want you to see from the confirmation class. Miss Amber Hules will come and bring, not Miss, Mrs. I always saw you, Miss Amber. Um, and the kiddos, they're going to get a chance to introduce yourself. Amber, you anything you want to say? Just that. We have worked, they have committed to being at church every Wednesday night since the beginning of school, since September. 
and they've worked really hard, and that is a hard thing to do, to go to school all day, and then to come and sit for another hour and go through some really deep things. But this last two weeks, they worked on writing their own creed about what they believe, so hopefully, my prayer, is that that kind of arms them for the next step in life of going to junior high and high school for some, and that that was an awesome journey to be on with them. So I will let them each say their names slowly to introduce themselves. Nevaeh Kidd. Say it one more time. You pulled it and pressed it. Nevaeh Kidd. Catherine Adams. Shelby Harper. Caitlin Russell. Grace Rauch. Riley Lindsay. Lauren Rule. Jackson Daniels. Tyler Cunningham. Brody Kaufman. Jaden Troublecock. Yeah, that was great. That was great. <laughs> Anything else you guys want to add? I have two middle names. I knew Jackson has two middle names. Mark Donald, if you care to know. Right? Jackson, Mark, Donald, Daniels. So I've tried to memorize their middle names, too, and I don't know if I'm going to make it completely. I'm working on it still. I'm getting there. Um, you know what? Later, you're going to answer questions about your decision to follow Christ, Right? and you're standing before this congregation, and they want to say something to you because I think we have a little bit of liturgy that we want you to respond to these folks. You're committing to follow Christ later. They're committing to commit to you. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life? And I'm sorry, and include these confirmands now before you in your care. God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. Ooh, that's too small. We found these confirmands with a community of love and forgiveness that they may grow in their trust of God and be found fruitful in the service of others. We will pray for them that they may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life. Now, they learned from the message they heard today that it's the gospel of Jesus Christ that let the righteousness and help you to live life. And so they've just committed as the body of Christ to share their love with one another and to grow together in Christ. Will you accept and receive what they've offered to you today? If you do, you say, we do. I do. I do. No, we do. I'm going to make you do it together. We do. We do. We do. <laughs> do. I've been throwing them off on these questions. You know what? Thank you guys for getting here this early. Please stand. It is a joyous day. Thank you, Rick. It's a joyous day. It's a joyous day for these, fam these young students and their families, and so we rejoice this with them because we have good news. We are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. May you go forth to share that in love, and may you guys too. Go in peace. Amen.